Hello everyone, welcome to Philosophy Gets Schooled. I'm Simon Kirchin, a philosopher based at the University of Kent, and I'm also director of the British Philosophical Association. This is the in-depth episode on deontology and the ethical philosophy of Immanuel Kant, where I talk with a couple of teachers, Michael Lacewing and Ben Jones. Because we go into depth on all topics regarding deontology and Kant, then it's quite a long episode, although we do break the uh, discussion into various segments separated by music. I hope you enjoy it, uh, but if you need a short episode, then there is an accompanying episode called Deontology Short, um, where I try to explain what's going on in Deontology and Immanuel Kant in about 10 minutes. Um, but this is the one to listen to when you're trying to revise what you've learnt and going through in detail um, everything that you're hearing in your lessons. Hope you enjoyed. Hello, welcome to Philosophy Gets Schooled. I'm Simon Kirchin, a philosopher based at the University of Kent. We're recording this episode in June 2022. Today's episode is all about deontology and Immanuel Kant. So we'll be thinking about what deontology is, whether it's a good moral theory, and what exactly Immanuel Kant was going on about. We'll also see what else we get onto. Joining me in this episode, we have Michael Laceling from Christ's Hospital School in West Sussex. Hi, Michael. Hello, Simon. Nice to be here. And uh, we've also got Ben Jones from King Edward's Sixth College in Stourbridge. Hi, Ben. Hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, great to have both of you with us. And in particular, uh, Michael, it's it's really good to see you because we haven't seen each other for, for ages, have we? Um, no, many years it's been. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Ben, perhaps we should say it's really good to have you on the programme because I, used to, I did all my A-levels at King Ed's in Stourbridge. So really good to have you here so perhaps your students might be listening to this uh, I would hope so yeah I would hope yeah. so yeah I'll be really annoyed if they're not <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well we'll see right well at least I'll listen to the first two minutes won't you yeah I'm sure you will yeah okay so let's get going with talking about deontology today then before we get onto that topic itself let's talk about normative ethics um, since deontology is one of the major theories that's part of this broader topic or area. I mean, I've talked about normative ethics in other episodes, but it won't do us any harm to recap. So, Michael, do you want to say a few words about how you understand normative ethics and explain it to your your students? Yeah, sure. So I think of normative ethics as an attempt to try and give general rules or principles or guidance about how to live in the broadest kind of way. Um, so the biggest question, I suppose, is how should one live? And we can think about trying to answer that in specific instances, uh, specific types of action, and th that would be practical ethics. But if we want to have kind of general ideas like, should we be trying to make people happy in the actions that we do, then we're getting into normative ethics. And it, the, the kind of three big theories that we have a look at uh, generally in philosophy, one is that notion of happiness and utilitarianism. It's trying to argue that, you know, that is the guidance that we should follow, trying to make people happy through the actions that we do. Another one uh, comes from Aristotle, and that looks at what kinds of people we should be. So what's a good way of being a person? What's a good way of living your life? And he's looking there at kind of character traits that we might have, like courage or honesty or things like that. And then the third theory is deontological ethics. And that's kind of, well, we'll get onto that in a moment, but that's sort of looking at the idea of actions being right and wrong in themselves in a particular way. So normative ethics as a whole is this kind of discussion between these, these theories and, and other ones, and we branch out into sort of religious ethics as well, which are trying mm -hmm. to give general guidance about how to act throughout one's life. Great. Ben, have you got any, any thoughts just on, on the back of this about how you explain things to, to your students? No, I think it's, it's very similar. When we look at normative ethics, I normally try and say that it's this idea of looking at first rules and principles. It's that idea of can you boil your ethical outlook down to just something simple that you could apply, that if somebody needed a kind of, you know, back of a matchbox answer of what your ethical mm -hmm. outlook was, 
then could you put it together? And it's going to be hopefully something a bit deeper than kind of the sort of deeper tees that we get on Facebook and things like that, that kind of thing where people have something like, you know, just live life to the max or YOLO or things like that sort of thing and trying to take that and say, okay, but there's, there's probably something bigger going on there. You've got limits to that. You don't think mm-hmm. that you should do that all the time. So where do you actually draw a line and say, actually, this crosses into something else? And that's kind of starts conversations about where our kind of personal small P philosophy on how yeah. to live crosses into a kind of capital P philosophy about what we ought to do, what we ought not to do, what it's right to do, what it's wrong to do, what's good, what's bad, those sorts of things. Great. So then let's think about deontology for for a while. So what do you think the advantage are of of being a deontologist? Anyone want to have a crack at that? I guess, um, yeah, I, I guess it would be simplicity, I suppose, in the sense of you've pretty much got a rule which then can develop into something maybe a bit more specific in other places. So Mm -hmm. if you've got a very solid basis foundation, I mean, this is what we're going to see with Kant, definitely. If you've got this solid foundation of what it is that makes something right or wrong, then you can literally just kind of come up with a list of things that you're allowed to do, a list of things that you're not allowed to do. Or in fact, to make it easier, list of things that you're not allowed to do. And then basically you can just do the rest, um, which is how a lot of deontology works. So I think that that simplicity of it in terms of application maybe is something that's quite appealing when you compare it to something like utilitarianism, where part of the problem was, well, what do we do in a situation where we need to actually calculate what the utility of a situation is going to be? And this is fairly straightforward. You just go, well, it doesn't matter what the utility is, just don't do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael? Yeah, I think deontologists tend to appeal to one of two sources of morality. So if you want to be able to answer the question, well, why should I be moral? Then deontologists feel they have a very secure answer to that. So one is God. You have ideas that, you know, that, that, that right and wrong derives from God's commands or God's will for human beings. And it's hard to gainsay that. I mean, if you're a theist, obviously, if you're an atheist, it's not. But if you're a theist and you say, well, you should be moral because this is what God says, it's like, well, OK, um, you can push that one. But that's kind of one source of moral duties. God's design for human beings. So that's kind of one element. The other element is is the notion of reason. And again, it's hard to to reject a notion if you go, so why should I be rational? Or what do you want, a reason in response Mm -hmm. to that? I think deontology kind of appeals to something very deep in human nature one way or another, and something which human beings supposedly share in common. And that's what gives it such a firm basis is this idea that, you know, we are all rational creatures and morality then has a grip on on all of us, because morality is an expression of of reason. And it's that faculty which which means we should be um, moral. But it's also, you know, what tells us what the right answers are. Great. Yeah, yeah. So we'll get on to this when we're thinking about Kant towards the end, but let, let's not mention him too too many times. So, but let's just think of this as a bit of a trailer, then, gents. So, what are the what are going to be the problems for deontology that we should be looking out for, uh, and then we can deepen them when we get there? Any any thoughts on this? Perhaps the the strengths are also in some ways the weaknesses. Um, so Ben was saying how you have a, a list of rules, and one could say that rules have to be extremely flexible to deal with the circumstances of life. Yeah. Um, and if you've got a, a set of rules, while that kind of gives you clear guidance, life very rarely fits into these neat pockets. So it, you're going to get yourself into sticky situations. Either way, your rule just seems really counterintuitive. It goes against, in a sense, the point of the rule itself. Or you're going to get problems where where you can't follow both rules at once. You've got a situation which falls under different descriptions. Um, Let's take loyalty and honesty or something along those lines. You have a situation where you can either be loyal or you can be honest. And, you know, we can imagine those kinds of situations where a friend asks you to lie for them or something along those lines. And it's, you know, it's not like these situations are outside people's experience. And I think deontology with its with its kind of clear guidance at the base level then has to get has to kind of really develop it, its kind of adjustments or interpretations of the rules and this is how you get for example from the ten commandments in the old testament you get the 
the Talmud, which is kind of discussing all the ways in which those those commandments of the Old Testament need to be uh, interpreted or applied, or the development of casuistry in, in Christian ethics. So similarly, if you've got a kind of clear set of answers um, for any deontological system, you're going to need people to say, well, this is how you should interpret it in this situation. But clarity can also be a rigidity, which doesn't make it fit life very well sometimes. Yeah, and I think something that we were talking a bit about when we did the utilitarianism episode, and it's something I always think about when I'm when I'm talking with students, is normative ethics is really great, and we've got these the various theories. You know, uh, we mentioned three at the start, but there are other ones as well. Uh, but what's really interesting about all these normative ethical theories is they tend to focus on one element or one aspect of our life. So in this case, we're thinking about action types themselves and rules based on them, such as do not steal, do not lie, which we're going to thinking a lot about, I'm sure, as, as this episode goes on. Um, but as you as you say, Michael, sometimes life gets messy and you've got these clashes between rules and there's just there's just something about the situation where, in, where intuitively we need to go one way, but our theory is telling us to go another. And sometimes that, that's the right thing to do. Sometimes morality is demanding and we need to heed the theory, but sometimes the theory is completely off and we can say, look, the theory is completely off because it's pretty obvious we should be doing this, morally speaking. And that, that crops up a lot, doesn't it, in, in various normative ethical theories, particularly, again, thinking about utilitarianism, where it's pretty obvious that even if you can maximise good consequences or promote the most happiness, it's pretty by doing an action, it's pretty obvious you shouldn't do that action. Ben, have you got any thoughts on, on this? No, I, th- I think that kind of sums it up. The thing that always comes to mind when I'm thinking about deontology, I suppose, or, or any of the normative theories is I remember reading something by or seeing something by James Rachels years and years ago, where he sort of talked about, I think it was James Rachels anyway, I apologise if I've misattributed this, but um, looking at normative theories almost like they're lenses through which Mm -hmm. you can look at the world. You can look at the world through a consequentialist lens or you can look at the world through a deontological lens. I remember that really sticking with me as a student and thinking that actually maybe the way to do (laughs) the way to do normative ethics is you basically take one of these elements and you push it as far as it will go. And what you'll actually tend to do is go through all of the really good stuff, like why we would actually believe that. And they've all got something really, really good to offer. And then they take you through a system where you actually start to go, yeah, we could do this. You know, we could actually figure out all the problems of the world using this. And then when you push it right as far as it will go, it always turns into something a little bit monstrous. It always turns into something actually that you would never want a human being <laughs> to actually be like. And and the point is, I think that we can discover these really really bad ends of deontology and consequentialism and things like that but hopefully then the idea is when we start pulling it back you might not be a deontologist or you might not be a consequentialist or a utilitarian at the end but hopefully you're just a bit better yourself at making these judgments of seeing where you're pushing your deontological aspects of yourself too far like your own i'm not going to budge from this moral stance where are you pushing that too far or you're look, it doesn't really matter about this. It's making people happy. Where are you willing to push that to? And hopefully then it's what I suppose we would like people to get out of philosophy, which is just they become better people. Mm -hmm. Um, And hopefully that's part of the process. It's not the only process, but it's part of the process, I think. Goodness, those are high hopes that people study philosophy and they become better people, Ben. I don't know know about you. Yeah, I, I I throw these out at the start of the course, and then by the end of it, they realise what a nihilist I really am. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay, listen, let's leave it there for that initial segment, gents. And um, we'll see you both in the next part when we'll be thinking about what Emmanuel Kant was going on about. And welcome back. Before we move on to this segment... This is just to remind you to check out our website. So if you go to my own personal website, Simon Kirchin, K-I-R-C-H-I-N, if you're intelligent enough to be listening to this, you're intelligent enough to find it. Um, I've got a list of topics um, that we're covering in uh, the current period. Uh, Most of them are in moral philosophy. If you fancy listening to the topics, then please do. And also if you fancy um, writing in to me at my University of Kent email address, please do so. And in future recordings, we want to use your questions and comments uh, if we can to help uh, shape our discussion. So um, we've discussed the main ideas behind deontology, Michael and Ben. Now let's get down to details. 
and talk about Emmanuel Kant and his ideas. Uh, and I'm imagining um, some of your students find Immanuel Kant sometimes a bit hard. So we'll, we'll think about that as well. Uh, so we, we'll, we've got a, a few things that we've got to cover, um, big topics that come up in Immanuel Kant's framework and development of his deontology. So goodwill, categorical imperatives and hypothetical imperatives and the categorical imperative and contradiction in conception and contradiction in willing tests, they're all big topics that we will have to cover. So let's uh, let us start things off. Michael, do you want to talk to us, first of all, about the goodwill? Because I often think that's probably the, the best idea to start things off, and then we'll see how things develop. Sure. So as a deontological theory, Kant is concerned with the rightness or wrongness of actions in themselves, as we yeah. said. So that kind of asks the question, so what, what makes an action the, the kind of action that it is, if it's not its consequences? Because we do talk about actions as lying, stealing, just the bad ones for now, but you know, giving to charity or whatever it is, something, we have these different ideas. And in addition to the consequences, then we can think about the notion of intentions. Yeah. And we need to kind of think of an intention as what it is that you, how you conceive of what it is that you're doing. And that's a, a big part of kind of what's going on. So, for example, we make a distinction between murdering somebody and accidentally killing them because yeah. there was no intent to bring about that killing. And that that intention then is something which is really an expression of our of our choice. Or what we're doing, we're doing sort of deliberately. You're doing it intentionally with an intention. And this is the basis then by which we can start to think about right and wrong actions in terms of that. So when we, when we act, when we choose to act, we, we are willing, we are making a choice to actually act on it, not just wishing for something, but willing, you know, you're actually going to do this and follow through on it. And you want then to understand the, the rightness or wrongness of the action in terms of the intentional choice that the person is making. So Kant's sort of focus is to start with the idea of, okay, so then within this kind of framework, we need to understand what good action is in terms of a good will. Mm -hmm. And so we've got these kind of two, two elements, the notion of the will, which is that ability to, to, to make choices, to have intentions and to, to act on them. And then whatever it is that's going to characterize that will. And it's that kind of that that part of it is is very important because it's going to be his sort of founding idea, and he he starts his groundwork of the metaphysic of morals, which is the text of Kant that we study at A level, and perhaps his most famous kind of presentation of his theory of morality, by saying the the only thing which can be good without any qualification, so in all circumstances, unconditionally, is the goodwill itself. And what he means by this is when you're trying to achieve something, if you're judging whether what you're doing is good or bad by what you're trying, by what you actually achieve, then it could be that taking any of those things in abstract could be right in some cases and wrong in others. So let's take the, the example of happiness, mm -hmm. which utilitarianism says is, you know, the end. It's always good. Happiness is good, says utilitarianism. And Kant says, well, there are cases where happiness isn't going to be good. Take undeserved happiness. Take happiness that results from the suffering of other people. Take happiness in a case where somebody gets away with something, um, where really what we want is them to feel unhappy, to be mm -hmm. punished or something like that. So always aiming at happiness doesn't look like it's unconditionally good. So we're not going to be able to describe what a good person, a good will chooses, um, or sorry, what makes a good will good in terms of what it's aiming at in that sense, you know, happiness, or maybe it's power, or maybe it's wealth or intelligence. We're going to have to somehow look at the notion of the will itself in order to um, understand what a good will is. Great. That's really, really helpful, Michael. There's loads packed in there. And perhaps just to go, just, just to delve in a little bit deeper for, for you, Michael, or, or for you, Ben. So that there's two other things that probably students might find helpful, at least in my mind, that students might find helpful, right? So for us to pause on the difference between willing and wanting, and then the idea of a maxim, which, which is really important in Kant's 
thought, which comes out of what you were just saying. So should we just think about those two? So how do you explain the difference between willing and, and wanting to, to students? I think the way that I normally do it is to just point out that we can want something without willing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can will something without wanting it. Uh-huh. In as much as if you just think about, and, and this is where the description of a maxim is probably going to be useful, um, but you can get the idea in your head, you've got a bunch of rules and principles, kind of guidelines for how to act uh, yeah. under different circumstances. And then on the on the other hand, you've got your desires and your needs and your wants, but you've also got the material world. You've got stuff yeah. that's out there. And so your actions are really connecting what's going on with your head with the rest of reality. It's kind of the the physical means by which you interact with stuff, yeah. depending upon what's going on in your head. Now, the will is kind of like the thing, which he almost he does actually say at one point, kind of like, eh, we got to leave this to kind of to the psychologists about what the what the will is to some extent. I can't give you a full description here. It's a bit psychological, but it is this thing that turns your ideas and principles in your head into actions. It kind of makes you do them. But that doesn't isn't the same as wanting it. So I could want one particular thing, and yet my will can make me do the opposite. So I could want that last piece of cake that somebody says, oh, does anybody want the last piece of cake? And you could want it, but some part of you goes, but you ought not to. And so the action that you actually come out with is, no, thanks, somebody else can have it. Yeah. So your your will and your want will often be correlated and kind of tied together quite a lot. But that doesn't mean that it has to. They can be separated off from each other. Okay, great. And and what about the idea of a maxim? Because that's sometimes, certainly when I'm teaching students at university, perhaps it says more about my teaching than about them, of course. They sometimes struggle with the idea of a maxim. Should we just pause a bit on that and just try and explain that? Sure. It's... um. I mean, it's a word which perhaps was was more popular in the translation of of Kant into the yeah. English um, than um, than it is now. But the idea of a maxim is this notion that that Ben was talking about of a sort of principles that you have in your head, your own kind of principles for for guiding your choices. So while it can seem that we have, you know, we just choose things on different occasions. In fact, of course, we consistently follow through certain ways of behaving, kind of repeatedly guided by, we not, may not have formulated them, ideas about how to live our lives. So, for example, you might be engaged in a whole series of choices related to your education, starting from when you set your alarm to get up in order to get to school on time. Um, through to how much time you spend on your homework or your revision or trying to stay attentive in class. And you, you might think all of these are very separate or different individual choices, but they're all guided by a kind of idea or commitment to get a good education. So to get a good education could be seen as um, a maxim of yours, a kind of a principle of action that you're going to follow on, on multiple occasions. It's going to inform the choices that you make repeatedly. Then there are going to be other maxims that you have, you know, to, to, to be a good friend um, to people. And that's kind of an important value of yours. And then the way that you are with people on different occasions with your friends would reflect that. So you can think of them as these, if you like, subjective principles of action, things which can be phrased to apply to sort of more than one situation, but they are your own guiding principles of choice. You choose things, perhaps not always knowing that you're choosing it on this basis, but guided consistently and repeatedly by this idea of what it is that you're aiming at in life or at that moment. Yeah, great. Thanks, both of you. That's that's all really helpful. Can we say something a little bit about duty? Of course we can, and, yes, and, sure. And goodwill. Um, I think so the notion of deontology is this idea of duty. We, we were talking about a central concept of looking at the action as right or wrong in itself. And so you get this idea of, of it being your duty to do right things and your duty not to yeah. do wrong things. So Kant, having said that he can't define the goodwill in terms of what it aims at, in terms of trying to achieve happiness or wealth or whatever, says that the way in which we can define the goodwill is in terms of duty. So a goodwill is a, is a will which is going to try to do the morally right thing because it's the morally right thing to do. 
Um, and so that's kind of the, the connection, and that's going to be an important stepping stone to his notion of categorical imperatives, that this idea is that what, what the goodwill is aiming at is the right thing to do. Now, of course, he hasn't told us what the answer to that question is, yeah. and when we'll get to that, but it's precisely because a, a goodwill is motivated by duty. It, it seeks to do the right thing for no other reason than it is the right thing to do. And that's where the kind of the will and the wanting kind yeah, of yeah. part that Ben was talking about. So there is a kind of wanting to do your duty, but it's a distinct kind of wanting. It's independent from other things that you want, like that last piece of cake, because it's more captured in the thought, as Ben put it, you, well, you ought to, you ought to not take it. And, and that's where the will comes in, when it's a good will, that you're motivated by that thought itself, or this is what I ought to do. And that's sufficient to get you to, to will it to do it in the case of a, of a good will. Great. Should we just dwell a little bit and talk about shopkeepers? Uh, the, um, the shopkeeper example is really there to draw a line between two different ways in which our actions might match with duty if you like, because he raises this idea. Yeah. He says, so, all right, so the idea is we ought to do our duty. So now we all just go out and we we find out what our duties are and we do them. Is, is that it? Um, and he says, well, no, we've actually got to kind of focus on this idea of duty and draw more out of it. And one of the things that he points out is that just because our actions may be in accordance with duty, it doesn't mean that they're from or out of duty. Yeah. And so the way in which he looks at that is uh, two shopkeepers. So let's say you've got one shopkeeper who – doesn't rip off their customers. They always give them a fair price and all those sorts of things, and polite and friendly and helpful. And then when you talk to them, you sort of say, well, you're a really great shopkeeper. You're a good guy and all that. And they say, yeah, well, you know, it's good for business. You don't upset the customers. And if you rip them off, you know, you get a bad name and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. And then you talk to somebody else and, you know, another shopkeeper who's doing exactly the same thing. And you talk to them, you go, you're a good shopkeeper, aren't you? You're a great guy. And they go, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, why would you rip someone off? I mean, that's an awful thing to do. You, you just don't rip people off. Now, the point is that Kant wants to make here is that, and it's going back to that first section. It's almost ref referring back to that first thing where he's looking at all of the different ways in which we might say that actions can be good, even though that it might not be from a good will. So good consequences out of good character and pointing out that they're not distinctly moral goods. And so he's trying to point out that the actions of the, the one shopkeeper who's acting in accordance with duty, that is the person who does what a person who acts out of duty would do, but for other reasons, isn't technically doing anything wrong as such. And they're not necessarily doing anything bad as such, but they're not doing of anything of distinct moral worth. You can't call them a good person or performing good moral actions, even if they're performing prudent actions or actions that somebody who works in a business school might applaud you for or something like that. On the other hand, the other person is performing these actions out of duty and therefore there is a genuine moral worth here to their actions. And you can see that by just switching a slightly different example. Imagine that the one shopkeeper could get away with changing their prices so that they're a little bit unfair. Imagine that they could tell the customers what they really thought and the customers would still come back. There's no necessary guarantee there that they wouldn't maybe start doing that a little bit, that they would start doing something that wasn't in their duty because it's not ultimately their reason for doing it. And now Kant's not the saying that that's the case. The person might carry on doing it. They might have other reasons for, for duty anyway, for acting in, in accordance with duty anyway. But the point is that it's only in that second case where the person is doing it because you don't rip people off that actually there's something of genuine moral worth. Whereas in the other case, it, we don't necessarily want to say that the person's bad or an evil person, but you can't say that they're doing something of moral value. Great. Really helpful. Thanks. Okay, so now let's move on then to different sorts of imperatives. So what's the difference between a categorical imperative and a hypothetical imperative? Um, shall I give this a go? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so three, three words, imperative, categorical, and, and hypothetical. So in, an imperative is just a fancy name for a command yeah you, know, you can think of it in terms of grammar you have imperatives which is telling somebody to do something and you have interrogatives which is asking something to somebody or something and you have descriptive sentences which just say how things are so imperative is is just the way in which a sentence is framed it's framed as a command do this you know shut the door please be quiet open your books now 
those are all imperatives. So an imperative is, is simply that. And we were talking about the notion of a maxim and the idea of having a kind of principle which guides your action. So suppose we frame those principles now as sort of imperatives. Let's say, you know, get a good education, to take the example before, or to be a good friend. You can now hear those as imperatives, be a good friend, get a good education. So now Kant says when we are acting, much of the time, most of the time, we kind of follow these principles that we have because there's something else we're seeking to achieve or something we can identify as our end. So we're following the, the imperative, the command in our heads as a means to that end. So that's why he calls them hypothetical imperatives. If you want something, then the thing you should do is this. For example, when you uh, arrive at the theatre to, to, to watch a play or something like that, there'll be an announcement, you know, could, could customers please take their seats now? Well, that's an imperative. But there is an assumed end, namely, you wanted to watch the performance. But of course, you know, at the end of the intermission, it's going to say, you know, customers, please take their seats now. And you don't have to do that. You thought the first half of the play was awful. You're, you're off. You're leaving. Mm -hmm. Do you have to take your seats now? No, you can, you can just go. So the command, take your seats now, is on the assumption that you want to watch the rest of the play. So it's hypothetical. If you want to watch the rest of the play, take your seats now. And that's a hypothetical imperative because it's got that kind of if clause. And so much of what we do is like that, you know, so suppose you're in education for a job. If you want a good job, then get a good education. I'm hoping you're not in education just for a job, but maybe you are. If you don't want to get a good job, you know, bum out of school. You could do that, I suppose. Many people would object. But if we remove that if and you just have a command, which doesn't have a condition, that would be a categorical imperative. So categorical here means without conditions. Okay, so it's removed that, that if. Um, it applies sort of objectively, universally. It doesn't depend on what you want, argues Kant. Now, it's, it's a bit of a debate as to whether there really are such things as categorical imperatives, but that's what Kant is going to argue. And he wants to say, Certainly at first sight, moral imperatives, you know, do not lie, are categorical. So we don't say do not lie um, unless you don't mind people hating you, in which case go ahead. Do not lie unless you, you quite enjoy punishment, in which case go ahead. That's not kind of the way in which we phrase or understand our moral language. When we tell people not to lie, we just mean kind of full stop. And if someone goes, well, I, don't, I like lying, it's good. Or you can imagine a serial killer in the dock and, the, you know, you do not commit murder. I really enjoy this, says the serial killer. That's not an appropriate response. It's misunderstood the imperative, do not kill. So it, it's supposed to apply to us independent of what we want. Again, we're getting that distinction between kind of wanting and willing. The imperatives are what we will, we, we should be following, we ought to be doing, independent of what we want. If there are such commands, they're categorical imperatives. Great. Listen, let's leave that segment there. And welcome back. OK, so we, we're gathering our building blocks to uh, help with Kant. So let's move on. Uh, I say with some trepidation, but I think this is the next way I would normally explain it, right? Um, so having got categorical imperatives and hypothetical imperatives, let's move to the biggies and think about the categorical imperative with a capital C and a capital I, because that's obviously, you know, a lot of what's going on in, in Kant where he's trying to get a sense of, you know, the, really the shape of what our moral lives is, right? This is, this is his conception. And a lot of this, perhaps, perhaps just as a kind of intermission here, right? So utilitarianism and deontology and also virtue ethics, they're kind of big conceptions and big stances about what our moral lives are. And I think this is now getting to the heart of, of how Kant conceives of what it is to be a moral being and what's going on. So with that little introduction, should we have a go at the, at the categorical imperative and perhaps think about the first formulation? So perhaps I'll just read it out and then one of you can come in and say how it connects with all the other preceding stuff and what it means. So the first formulation of the categorical imperative, normally called the formula of universal law, acts only on that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. 
So let's see if we can we can unpack that then. Okay. Um, I mean, would you like a bit of background to the principle or just sure, what the principle absolutely. means? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 it's up to you, Ben. I, I'll, I'll just edit whatever you say anyway, so it's fine. That, that's fine. No, this is fine. <laughs> <laughs> so what I was going to sort of introduce this a little bit by thinking about how this connects, obviously, with the idea of duty and so on, but also the big connection here with reason. I think that this is, as you've talked Mm -hmm. about utilitarianism before, utilitarianism is this, um, when you look at Mill and Bentham, is this big empiricist theory. What's the point in talking about human behavior unless you actually observe human behavior? Let's just look at what we like, what we don't like, what motivates us, what doesn't motivate us, make moral theory out of it. Kant is sort of saying that that doesn't tell you anything. If you actually look at our discussions about morality and we just look at what people do, doesn't actually, you know, he actually says at one point, there's no point in starting with a bunch of examples and then trying to derive moral principles for them, from them. Because by picking your examples, you're already making a moral judgment about what things are examples of people doing wrong things and examples of people doing right things. There's got to be some basic principle underpinning all of our moral judgments somewhere. This, this the categorical imperative that he's talking about, the ultimate command and he says that's the purpose of the work is to is the sole purpose of this work is to find the supreme principle of morality and the reason as we've talked about before that this is found within reason he says there's various places he talks about it but if i'm going to give a moral command this sort of supreme ought then we have to respect that these oughts are things that apply to rational beings. They don't apply to animals. They don't apply to beings without rationality. So it has to be a being that can experience its own wants and needs and feelings and virtues and things as things that also have this accompanying, ooh, but I ought not. Without that, you don't have kind of our understanding of morality. So he's really rooting a lot of his understanding of where morality appears to us. He doesn't say that it's where it comes from, but we suddenly realize where morality is rooted when our reason jumps up and says, oh, you ought not to do this, despite how much you want to do it. And so if you take that idea of what we're trying to find is a basic principle which any rational being, whether they were human or angel or alien or anything like that, could see it as a valid rule, a maxim that they would adopt themselves, then that itself would show you that it was a rule which could stem from this categorical imperative, that it could be a rule of pure reason that anybody could follow. And that's ultimately what he's trying to say here, is he's trying to say, When you act, and in particular, he's sort of like trying to think about times when maybe we we are in a bit of a moral dilemma. Make sure that when you're acting, the maxim that you follow at that point in time could then become a universal law for everybody, a a law, a, a, a rule that they would see as being, in the lovely translation I read, not just necessary, but necessitating. It's kind of like you feel it as impressing itself on you, that it becomes a law that that any rational individual would see as a valid maxim to act upon. Because if you can't do that, then you can't say that this rule has this universality that, that moral rules should do. Moral rules are about oughts. They're not about do you like, do you want? And so it has to be something that all these people can grasp. Right, that's uh, that's really good. Yeah, just to come in here, perhaps just, again, a kind of a bit of a, a pause for, for people listening. Just thinking about deontology, where we've already had a number of examples already. So do not steal, do not lie, you know, help people and so on. Because in fact, if you're a utilitarian, you just got, well, if you're an act utilitarian, of course, you've just got your one rule, right, which is maximise good consequences, maximise happiness, whatever exactly how you you might um, sharpen it. But, of course, if you're a deontologist, as, as we've already mentioned, you've got a whole range of rules and principles. But, of course, you could have thousands of rules and principles. You could have the principle, you could have a categorical imperative, which was steal whenever you get the chance or lie if you want to, I mean, kind of Michael's example from from earlier on, or, you know, help people, but only if they've got brown hair or something like that. And so I suppose what's going on here as a kind of pause for everyone is we need some basis, some idea, 
where we can choose certain rules or, or know that certain rules are the moral ones and, and not have the other ones, right? But, but how on earth do we do that? Do we just pick them out randomly from a hat? Is it just intuition or is there some other basis? And that's really the, the area we're in at the moment now, right, about the categorical imperative. There's got to be some general basis to, to working out which rules we're choosing and, and, or which, which ones are identifying as the moral ones rather than just choosing. Okay, that, that was really helpful, uh, Ben, thinking about the categorical imperative and that formulation. Perhaps again, another question back to you. I, I'm guessing that A-level students find this bit really tricky. Would that be fair? The next really? bit, certainly. There's something very abstract in Kant. Um, there's something very understandable in utilitarianism. You know, you want to be happy. Other people want to be happy. Let's make everybody happy. Ta-da. And Kant has sort of very much abstracted away from that. You know, and he's you've got this formulation, act only on that maxim through which you can at the same time will it to be a universal law. There are so many moving parts. We've talked about the will. We've talked about maxims. Why universal laws? That was to do with this notion that everybody could sign up to this particular yeah. kind of way of acting as well. But you know, trying to understand how how that actually works. So we thought a little bit about where it comes from and the notion of of reason and and the and the goodwill in itself and the idea of duty. So we've got this idea that this way of behaving is a way which any rational being could behave in this way. And, and that shows that it's coming from reason and not from our individual desires and wants. Yeah. And that's kind of really important, as Ben was saying. But how on earth do you apply that? And if you go around, you go to your you know, five-year-old that you're trying to get to understand the value of not stealing his little sister's sweets. And you go, act only on that maxim. <laughs> this is not going to be a good parenting device, right? I mean, what is this going on? So Kant takes this to be a kind of explanation of what lies behind our normal moral rules. And one of the ways that he tries to sort of help us make this connection is to take a number of examples and explain why what he's put in the categorical imperative really explains what's going on in those examples. And he thinks there are two ways in which one of our maxims, one of our kind of principles of action can fail to pass this categorical, fail to be in accordance with the categorical imperative. And the first way he talks about is called contradiction in conception. And the, and the second way is contradiction in will. Okay, so. Here we go, deep breath. I, yeah, shall I carry on? Okay. Yeah, go. yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay, fine. So the contradiction in conception really turns on this notion of could everybody act on this? And this is the notion of the universal law bit in the categorical imperative. So, what he wants to say is there's because we're, we're dealing with reason here and the kind of the, the strongest test of reason is related to contradictions. Right. We know that mm -hmm. contradictory sentences just can't be true. And that's a kind of theoretical test with with something like, I don't know, all four sided figures have just three sides. Right. We just know that that's not going to turn out to be right. OK, it's not going to turn out to be correct. There's a kind of contradiction. We were trying to think of a four sided figure with three sides. We can't conceive of such a thing. It's an impossibility. How could a square be a triangle? You know, kind of thing. So that's not going to work. So it turns out there's a different kind of contradiction, a practical one, because we're dealing with actions. Suppose I decide I do want to st steal whenever I feel like it, using your example earlier. OK, so I'm going to steal whenever I want to. Now, I'm going to now have to go. OK, so that's my maxim to steal whenever I want to. Now, could I will this to be a universal law? Let's focus on it becoming universal. So I have to imagine a situation. I have to conceive of a situation in which everybody has that maxim. So everybody steals whenever they want. Let's kind of think this one through. Like everyone's doing it. So everyone knows everyone's doing it. And the changes to the world would be enormous. I mean, to the extent you go into a classroom and you just take whatever you want and everybody's doing it. So there's no kind of you know, system where people are trying to stop each other doing it. Everyone's acting this way. You can imagine, actually, the conception of private property immediately goes. I walk into your office and I go, oh, that's a lovely computer. And I walk out with it. You know, and you're like, oh, where's my computer gone? Well, quickly, we would lose that sense of it being my computer or your computer unless other people weren't always taking our stuff, because as soon as everybody's taking everybody's stuff, then it's no, it's everybody's stuff. It's not mm -hmm. anybody's stuff. Well, now if you're in a situation where nobody owns anything, you can't actually steal it from them. And there's the contradiction in conception. Can you steal something when it doesn't belong to anybody else? 
So I'm breathing in air and I'm breathing out air. Am I stealing anybody's air? No, it's not an act of theft because it's not owned. So in order to be able to steal something, people must own stuff. But the only way in which people can own stuff is if not everybody is stealing everything all the time. So it turns out to be actually impossible for everybody to steal whenever they wanted to. Because if they were, then there would be no private property. And if there's no private property, then they're not stealing. So if everybody steals, nobody steals. So it's actually a contradiction in conception. It's an unimaginable situation in which people both manage to steal at a time when everybody is stealing. You couldn't do it. It's a contradiction. That's the first test. Great. That was really helpful, Michael. Ben, do your students struggle with with all this stuff as well? Yeah, it's it's a tricky one because... And I think you have to come up with your own examples sometimes because Kant's examples can seem really counterintuitive. He seems to go around his wrist to get to his elbow on some of them. It's really, really difficult in some of these cases where his own formulations of them, like his own examples, are really convoluted. And you, it makes you wonder why anybody would have that maxim in the first place. But actually, when you do look at some of these pretty straightforward, simple ones, just like the idea of property or the idea of making promises, for example. So if it was always okay to break promises, then you could never really go through the process of making a false promise in order to, you know, con somebody out of some money or whatever, because nobody would ever believe you. The whole practice of promise making, which kind of relies upon somebody believing you and you getting something from them, would collapse. But yeah, I mean, because it's quite a difficult thing to get your head around and, and to, to get them. I think the thing that students have always got to remember is Kant is not saying, imagine living in this world, wouldn't it be horrible? This is not like a, a rule utilitarian thing where he goes, well, if you had this rule, the rule, the world would be horrible. And if you had this rule, the rule would be nice. The world would be nice. Um, he's not saying that. He's saying it's just it's just inconceivable that one could even imagine such a law. Which is slightly different, especially when students can imagine that law. They they just go, yeah, I can imagine that law. And you go, no, you. He's trying to tell you it's inconceivable that you should be able to universalize that. But yeah, once they've got their head around that, that it tends to clunk into place a little bit. Yeah, and I suppose just reflection on this and those two examples, those two classic examples that you've both given us, so the the stealing one and then the promise one. Um, certainly for my students, the penny drops with some of them where you actually just explain and get them to think about the, the, the concept of stealing and the concept of, of promise making. Mm. Because no one's denying, even in, in the way that Michael's explained it, you, you're going into the room and you're taking the computer and you can walk out with it, you can pick it up. But in this world where everyone's doing it, it's not a theft, it's not a stealing. It's a picking up of a computer and taking away. It's just that other things need to be in place for it to be a theft Namely, need, that we need to have this, this idea of private property. And similarly, in the promise making, you can say a form of words that we would typically associate with making a promise. It's just that in order for there to be a promise, there needs to be both someone who's making the promise and someone who accepts it as a promise. But in a world where everyone's routinely breaking their promises, no one accepts promises because no one believes anyone, as you, as you said uh, ben and so the whole the, the the whole culture the whole convention around promises just falls away right just as it did with with private property and once once people get their heads around that that you can still be going into a room and taking a thing picking it up that is and you can still use a form of words that we that we typically associate with promise you can do that it's just they don't become thefts and they don't become promises then people then get to understand what what Kant's going on about at least i, I find anyway yeah, I think the the thing about promising as well, when you were talking there about useful examples like picking up the computer and so on, I think sometimes students as well, when you're talking about promising, they understand things like you can make a promise to yourself and you can, you can make promises to people uh, and you've, you have promised just by saying it's like a speech act. When you say, I promise, you promise and, and it's just fixed then. But actually, we go through the example sometimes about how, let's say that I'm really stressed out and one of my students says, let me do some of this work for you. Let me run that stuff down to the photocopier for you and do it. And I say, it's all right. Don't worry. And they go, look, I, I promise if you, if you, you know, let me do this, your day will be easier. Just let me go down. I promise I'll get it to you by lunchtime. And I go, okay, you know, it's fine. Seriously, it's not your job. And then they come to class that afternoon and I go, so where's the photocopying? And they say, well, you told me not to. And I say, no, but you said I promise. A promise holds even when I reject it. Like then they go, well, but you told me not to. You told me not, you told me not to do it. You rejected my promise, so the promise doesn't hold. Then they start to see how actually a promise can't just be something that you fling out there. 
it's got to be flung out and then caught by the person and accepted as something binding. There has to be that acceptance. Otherwise, I would be able to hold you to all the things that I told you you didn't have to do. Good. Well, that's that's one ticked off then, contradiction in conception. <laughs> so should we go to contradiction in, in uh, willing then? I can give it a shot if you want. On, okay. <laughs> the contradiction will is maybe the slightly easier to get, but sometimes I think when students explain it, they can get a bit jumbled. But actually just thinking about it, it's sort of the, the easier one. There's a slightly more vague phrase there where he says that contradiction in will is where we universalize a maxim, but the the maxim cannot be sort of reasonably willed or it can't be willed by a reasonable individual. So it's not so much that there is this inherent contradiction just by looking at the concepts. You can't sort of a priori sit down and look at the words and what they mean and then realize that when you apply those to reality, the reality of the world sort of creates this contradiction. It's more that no reasonable being that acted according to maxims could actually put this into play universally because there's something about willing that as an end which would actually undermine your means to get it to some extent. So if we think about the idea of ends, that I have goals, things that I wish to achieve, things that are important to me, um, or just everyday normal things, um, like things that I currently want, and then I've got the means to those, the things that I have to do in order to get them, then it would be completely unreasonable of me to will some sort of end and then at the same time will the means to that end out of possibility to make it so that I couldn't actually achieve that goal. And so if we take the the simple example that he comes up with where if I say, look, I'm just a good guy. I just want to, I don't want to cause anybody any harm. I just want to get on with my life and I'm not going to cause harm to anyone, but I'm also not going to ask anything of anybody and I'm not going to do anything for anybody either I just want to live this completely self-sealed life where nobody comes in and I don't affect anybody else that's fine they, like he says you, you're not doing anything morally wrong there I could you know in the sense of a contradiction in conception you could imagine that and there's nothing in the concepts involved there that mean that you're doing anything wrong but how exactly are you going to do this? I mean, automatically, you're already probably at this stage that you're making this judgment, you're probably already living in a house. You're going to have to rely on other people to fix things, maybe. If you don't know how to fix them, how are you going to fix them yourself? Um, you've got to learn. So you're going to have to use somebody else's website or YouTube. You're going to have to buy somebody else's book, which means you have to go to a bookshop and buy a DIY book. So you are always reliant upon other people in this scenario. Um, so you can't live a life that doesn't rely on other people. It's just not possible. So actually, it would be completely unreasonable of you to kind of will or this ability to be independent and to will all of your own ends and goals. I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to do that. And then eliminate from that the willingness of other people to help you by saying, well, they don't have to help me either because you are actually going to need that. So it's not a contradiction in conception, but you couldn't actually reasonably will that. Uh, good. And in fact, I think at, at this stage, I, I always emphasize to students that, you know, Kant and all this stuff can seem incredibly abstract. That's because it is. But actually what we see, particularly in contradiction and willing, we see that, that Kant is really thinking about morality as something inherently social. It's not just lots of individuals making these abstract decisions. We're in a world of other of other beings, right, who are just like us. And he's thinking, what is it like to be a moral being like us? It's to be in a world with other moral beings, and we're connected to those. And that really comes out strongly, I think, in, in the contradiction in, in willing test. Michael, have you got anything to, to add to, to this bit? Yeah, I think the, these two tests come straight out of the things that we have been saying earlier about reason and the distinction between will and wanting. Perhaps that's the only thing to kind of connect it up in the notion of the goodwill. Okay, so there's two elements to this. Your morality comes out of rationality, and that becomes really clear in the contradiction in conception. And there's this distinction between a will and what you want. And as Ben sort of explained, that you might think that you want a life in which you don't interact with other people, you don't rely on them, and you, you, you don't provide anything for them. But you couldn't actually will such a life. Um, and so it brings out really strongly these two elements of Kant's deontological theory, that the rationality, the basis in human reason and the basis in human will, which is something distinct from people's wants and desires. Great. Listen, let's leave that segment there. 
and then we'll we'll come back and we'll do some summary of everything we've already been thinking about. And in fact, in, in particular, then we'll lead on to things like perfect and imperfect duties and we'll think about other things as well that we haven't covered but that's all in a moment and welcome back so in this segment what we're going to do is just review what we've got where we've got to so far and then we'll pick up and what we were talking about just now at the end of the previous segment about contradiction conception and contradiction willing and finish off some of the, the main parts of Kant's deontology. So just want to have a want to have a go at summarizing in about two minutes what we've done so far. I can try. Go on, Michael. Okay, so we started with the notion of deontology, which is a normative ethical theory, which centers on the idea of certain actions being right or wrong in themselves. And we can understand this in terms of duties, duties to do the right actions and not to do the wrong actions. And Kant develops this in terms of his idea of the goodwill, where he wants to argue a goodwill is not good because it aims at particular things like happiness, but good because it does its duty just because it's its duty to to do those things. So a person is a good person if they do what is right because it is right. So then we had to turn to the question as to what makes something right. And here we introduced the notion of a categorical versus a hypothetical imperative. So a hypothetical imperative is something that you do because there is something that you are aiming at. So you, you choose to do that action because of something that you want. My example was you choose to go back into the theater to watch the second half of the play because that's what you want, but you don't have to go back in. But moral imperatives look like they are categorical. Um, and so we get this idea that the only way that you should act is so that your maxim could be a universal law. It could be willed as a universal law. And we explained what this meant. So what the goodwill does um, is act only on that maxims, which pass two tests. The test of contradiction and conception is where everybody could theoretically act on this maxim in a practical sense. And the contradiction in will, which is that a will could will this maxim, could act on this, um, is reasonable to do so. The, the maxim doesn't fall foul of the way in which the world would be if, if everybody was to act on this maxim. That was a pretty good summary in two minutes, Michael. Well done. <laughs> okay, so let's just pick things up there from what you, what you just finished with, Michael, on contradiction, conception, contradiction, willing. Because there's a, another two other pieces of Kantian terminology that often come up, which is perfect and imperfect duties, which relate to those two contradiction tests. Does someone want to explain what imperfect and perfect duties are and how they relate? So if you look at a perfect and an imperfect duty, um, think about what we discovered in those two tests that we looked mm-hmm. at. And in the first test, what we seem to do is put forward some sort of maxim like, if I don't have something and uh, wish to have it but don't have enough money, I'm allowed to steal it. Yeah. And what we've realized was that if you then universalize that, it becomes a contradiction in conception. It becomes something which could never be the case and therefore can never be carried out. And therefore it eliminates the possibility of having that as a maxim. Now he says that this generates what we call perfect duties. And these perfect duties are duties which always hold, which have no exception and which we must always follow. Um, But what you'll actually kind of notice when you look at the examples is they're very much sort of phrased Negatively, they're about exclusions. They're about what you're not allowed Mm -hmm. to do. So while you might sort of have a big, long maxim that's got to do with, you know, if I want to have something and I don't have it, then I'm allowed to steal it from somebody else. What that boils down to is actually don't steal because you've shown that it's never, it's not okay to steal and therefore don't steal. Um, There is never a, a case where you would be allowed to steal. Now, an imperfect duty it's wrong to say that you don't always have an imperfect duty. You, you, you do have this duty. It doesn't go away. It's just that the carrying out of that duty doesn't take the form of some sort of permanent exclusion of a certain form of behavior or something like that. So in the second case, we were talking about helping other people. Now, Kant is saying that you must, if you like, never not help people. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that you always have to help people. And that's because you have lots of other duties as well. So it's very important that we 
help other people. But imagine that I spend so much time helping other people that I neglect myself, that I neglect my own duties, for example. Uh, so I neglect um, my development of my own talents, my chance to wind down and all those sorts of things, my developing my own artistic abilities or, or my philosophical credentials or whatever it might be. These are things where you, you do have the duty to help other people. And that's not a duty that goes away. But the way in which you practice that is not something that you can practice 24 hours a day. You can practice not murdering 24 hours a day. You just have to not yeah. murder 24 hours a day. But you can't help other people and help yourself and develop your talents and da 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 24 hours a day. It's not going to work. So your imperfect duties are those duties that you have, which are actually kind of phrased a lot more along the lines of the things that you can actually do, kind of phrased a bit more positively. Make sure you're doing this. Make sure you're doing that. With the understanding that you are not expected to do them all the time, 24 hours a day. Okay, great. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. And in fact, perhaps just worth pointing out, because again, thinking about you know times when I've taught and my students. So student, students certainly initially read perfect and imperfect and think that perfect means the very best, right? Which is typically the, how we use that word, right? And it doesn't mean that at all in this situation, right? Perfect means highly specified. Well, that's, that's a better understanding of what's going on. Highly specified, i.e., do not murder, do not steal, do not, you know, and, and as you say, they're, they're very often phrased in this negative way, they're actions which which are forbidden. And so there's just a perfect way in which you carry out this duty, namely, don't do it, right? It's highly specified. Whereas in the case of imperfect duties, there's a kind of general duty, which is like, say, helping others, but actually how you carry that out how you specify that duty is then up to you in your everyday life. I think that's very important. In fact, something else you mentioned, Ben, I think perhaps worth dwelling on and just bringing out, because in fact, we haven't talked very much about it. So perhaps this is a good moment to, to mention it. You said also, perhaps you have a duty towards yourself. And of course, as, as we know, for Kant, you have as much duty towards yourself as you do to other people, because what Kant values is, as we say, the goodwill. Or rationality. I mean, this sounds a very abstract way of putting it, but we're all embodiments of rationality. And I should be valuing myself as much as I'm valuing other people. So those imperfect duties, so helping others, I have as much reason, as it were, to value myself and help myself and nurture my talents. That nurturing my talents is a is a major thing for, for Kant, as well as helping other people, because what I'm trying to do is respect rationality as such ration, you know respect the the embodiment of all all instances of rationality and that might be other people it might be myself so in a way i've always whenever i talk to students say it's kind of it's it's a morality for the modern age right where there's kind of it's all about self-care as well as uh, helping other people in these memes you get on on social media um it's not quite i think what kant had in mind but that kind of gives you an idea of what's of what's going on okay good so that was really helpful Ben, with, with perfect and imperfect duties. And so far, we've thought about that first formulation of the categorical imperative. Should we think about the, the second formulation? And shall I read that out? And then uh, that'll give you a chance to, to see who's going to volunteer to explain explain this one. Act in such a way that you always treat humanity in your own person or in any other, never simply as a means, but always at the same time as an end in itself. So I've just been talking about both ourselves and other people. What about what that's all that stuff at the end about end in them in themselves? Who wants to pick that up? I can give it a go. Yeah. So I mean you've you have kind of really helpfully unpacked already that that middle bit. And by humanity there in that formulation, Kant means that capacity for a rational will. Act so that you always treat a rational will never simply as a means, but always an end in itself. So what Kant's trying to do here, he, he connects the two, the two formulations. They sound very different, but he, he says they are equivalent. And the first one gives us that emphasis on, on law. And this was the idea that Ben was explaining about how, you know, every rational being needs to be able to sign up to this maxim to act on it. And that's what tells us it's coming from reason rather than something specific about your own desires or needs. So what is that then? You know, how can we, that kind of gives us that notion of law, which is sort of the, the, the what Kant calls the form of reason. It applies to everybody equally. But what's really what he calls the content of it? What's it about? Well, we said that's kind of the goodwill is the rational will. So we're kind of picking up this, this notion of that 
So in a sense, when, when you're, you're goodwill and you want to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, if you're trying to think about that in terms of, so what's the right thing to do? Well, it's to treat the ability for rational will as itself something which is morally important. Okay, and we, we said the only thing which is unconditionally good is, is the goodwill. That's where Kant, Kant starts the argument. So we go back to that and we say, okay, so the thing which is always good is rational will. It's, it's a will which is you know, this ability of ours to choose to be morally good people. So that can't be weighed against anything else. That's kind of something of real value. And so you, you must, morally speaking, that's something which you must always respect. So what does it mean to have it as an end in itself rather than a means to an end? So we normally take the, the value of a means, of an action, say, that you're doing from the end. So, you know, you might say, well, what's the point of an education? And maybe you view that it's just a stepping stone towards a career of some kind. And what's the point of a career? It's just a stepping stone towards money. And you think, so, OK, if I don't really care about the end, I don't really have to care about the means. The means isn't valuable in itself. It's just got a kind of what we call an instrumental value. Its value is very much given by what you're trying to achieve. And Kant says, don't treat people like that. Don't treat yourself like that. I mean, let's focus on other people initially. So don't treat people as just a way of getting what you want in life, as though they're somehow you could discard them. In particular, don't treat their, their ability to make choices, their rationality, their will as just something that you can manipulate to achieve what it is that you want, just as a means to your own end. So you always have to take into account the fact that other people have this ability to choose to do good or bad, but they have this ability. So let's take a, an example of lying. We talked about kind of false promising. That, let's take that example of lying. So you lie to someone saying, I promise, when you don't really, you have your fingers crossed behind your back or something. And you say, oh, no, no, I promise, it, let me the money. I promise to pay you back. But you're lying. You have no intention of paying then you're kind of undermining their free will in this way, that you've deceived them. And when you want to make a choice about what to do, you want the right information so you can make an informed choice. And you're not getting them the information that they need to make an informed choice. So you're sort of undermining their rational choice. It's a bit like, you know, trying to convince somebody of, of believing a truth, but on the basis of false evidence. It's the same kind of thing. You're not respecting their rationality. So the idea here is that you mustn't lie to people because to lie to someone is not to respect their rational ability to choose. If you said, give me the money, I can't afford to pay you back. I'm never going to pay you back. You want to just give me the money? They could still choose to do it. But if you say, oh, I promise to pay you back, it's going to happen you're lying to them, then you're, you're misleading them. You're not allowing them to make a really free choice. So you mustn't do that. You mustn't treat them as people as just a means to an end. You've always got to, to respect their ability to make choices according to their own desires, according to their own will. So that's what he means by saying you've got to treat them as an end in themselves, not as a means to an end. Great. That was really helpful, Michael. Let's leave things there then, because I think we've covered most, if not all, of the moving parts. And then we'll see everyone in the next segment where we'll try and put, put all these together by thinking about some of the problems for Kant and, and deontology generally. And welcome back. Okay, so Michael and Ben have been doing sterling work, I think, explaining all of these different parts of Kant's deontological system. And I suppose it is a system or a big conception, a big framework, where really in the end, we're getting it, trying to get something simple. Deontological theory, we think that actions themselves can be right or wrong. And from that, we build particular rules and principles. But which rules and principles? There can be thousands of them. As I said, we could have rules and principles such as do not steal and do not kill and do not lie. But we could have rules and principles that say steal whenever you want to or wear a blue jumper, but only on a Wednesday. All of those sort of things. But we need to work out and sift through which ones are the proper moral rules and which ones, which actions should be forbidden, obligatory and permissible. And that's really what we're trying to do. And Kant's just trying to, uh, using our, what he thinks of as our common conception of morality and trying to tease out in a very 
philosophically informed, abstract way, really what's going on. And that's really, even though it seems very abstract and, and sometimes very complicated, that's really what he's trying to get at. Which are the rules that we should be following? And then we get all of that Kantian kind of superstructure of the categorical imperative and, and how he conceives of us and, and of other people. Perhaps we haven't said this enough, but I think there's something that's completely kind of genius about Kant, particularly for me in contradiction in conception, contradiction in willing, in, in getting, a, getting to a point where he can say, aha, don't you see, this is the explanation of why we can't imagine everyone just going around stealing all the time because the whole idea of, of ownership, as, as Michael was explaining, just falls apart. And the same with, with promising as, uh, as, as Ben was explaining. Okay, so that's all positive, right? But there are some problems with deontology and there are some problems with Kant. So shall we work our way through some of the main ones? So, so of the ones I've, I've got in mind, so should we think about clashes between duties, first of all? Who wants to have a go at, at that, Ben? Okay, one of the things that's been raised about Kantian ethics, in fact, it was raised towards Kant during his lifetime, was the fact that if we have these rules where they're sort of absolute, where you must never do X, you must never do Y, what happens if I was in a situation where I've got two rules, X and Y, and by following rule X, I sort of violate rule Y and vice versa? So the simple example... And I think we should kind of, you know, kind of give Kant a bit of credit here because it is, it's a bit of a nasty setup in the example. Imagine if somebody knocks on your door and they're very clearly standing there with a murder weapon. They've got an axe or a chainsaw or something. And they say, hi, I'm looking for your friend. I mean to murder them. Are they at home? And you know that they're at home. They're, they're in your house as you're speaking. Now, we have a difficulty here because our immediate instinct is, well, you obviously lie to the to the murderer. You obviously say, no, they're not at home, and the murder would hopefully go away. But that would be lying. We've already said that you can't universalise lying. So that would be a contradiction in conception if we were going to be doing this. And on the other hand, what we want to do is save our friend. And we're now putting our friend at risk here by telling the murderer where they are or saying, yes, of course they're at home. Now, we're doing our duty by telling the truth, but what we're also doing here is certainly not really treating our friend as an end in itself um, at this point in time. So there's a clash here between two duties that we're supposed to have, kind of protecting our friend, but then also avoiding telling a lie. And the, the way that it's put to Kant in the, in the paper that was written for him to reply to was that if you could only say yes or no, Mm -hmm. which is kind of like one of those would-you-rather questions. And you go, I wouldn't like to pick either of those. And your friend goes, no, no, you've got to. You've got to pick one. So immediately Kant's put in a position where he has to go, Ugh, well, I guess you've got to tell the truth. And he kind of looks at all the different ways in which telling the truth would be the right thing to do because you have this perfect duty to tell the truth and you don't know the consequences of your action. What happens if you told a lie? And as the, you know, the, the axeman is walking away from a house, your friend sees them and tries to escape and they bump into each other in the alley or something like that, that there's all these other considerations. And so actually the best thing that you can do is kind of tell the truth under those circumstances. Now, most of us might have just gone, that's an unfair question. That's because we don't just have to say yes or no. There's loads of other options here, like withholding the information or distracting mm -hmm. them or whatever it might be. But it does raise the question of whether or not there are possibilities where you could be in a situation where doing one duty would ultimately be a sort of violation of another and vice versa. And therefore, you're caught in this sort of catch-22 situation. Great. Uh, Michael, anything to add to that one? I think the way that Kant could try to resolve this is, is constrained by the way he's built his theory. Because our, our temptation would be to say, well, why don't we just turn the rule from do not lie into do not lie unless you're saving a life? The problem is the whole thing's built on categorical imperatives. They're not meant to have these conditions. And you can say, OK, so my maxim is do not lie except to save a life. And then I try and change that, you know, universalize that. And that kind of goes against the spirit of the way in which Kant intends the system to work. But in, in other works, he does allow for what he calls the, you know, the, the judgment to kind of come in. Well, what really is your maxim? What's going on here? 
But he is rather, you know, his hands are rather tied behind his back because he's got this system whereby morality is meant to be these objective, universally applicable rules. And we were saying at the beginning, life is sometimes a little bit messy and we need to bend the rule and we need to amend the rule. And a rule utilitarian, of course, would be straight in there and saying, no, you know, do not lie is not as good a rule as do not lie except to save a life. That's a much better rule. So we should. But Kant doesn't really have the right philosophical grounding um, I suppose, to easily make those sorts of concessions to real life. So it is a, it is a problem for the way that he thinks about the construction of, of moral principles. Yeah, good. That's right. And I think, I mean, there's, there's no easy resolution to this for, for Kant. Um, but actually it does bring in that, brings in kind of another issue for Kant. So let's get on to that one, which is the phrasing of, of our maxims and the fact that we can just add extra bits in <laughs> and sometimes we can universalize and sometimes that gets the result, right result but sometimes it doesn't get the right result so what's going on with that can, can we tease out that sort of issue the notion of act only on that maxim through which you can at the same time will that be a universal law i think suffers from this rather more than the second formulation and some philosophers have argued therefore that actually there's a distinction between the formulations. But if we, we take that first formulation, it looks like I could universalize something if I build in the sorts of conditions which would avoid that kind of, say, contradiction in conceptual will. So we could take that notion of stealing and we could amend it. So we could amend it so that it doesn't generate a contradiction in conception. So I'm not going to say I get to take whatever I like whenever I like and universalize that. But I'm going to put in some kind of weird condition, which just I'm putting in to make it pass the test. So it's like I'm going to, you know, I can steal whatever I want but only on Tuesdays because my name is Michael and only from stores which have more than uh, six letters in their name. And now we try and universalize this. So only people called Michael and only on Tuesdays and only these stores would the whole conception of private property collapse. Absolutely not. I mean, I guess technically it could be more difficult if everybody knew they were doing this. Those stores would always ask you your name when you went in. But, you know, it doesn't generate the same kind of contradiction in conception. Could you act on it? Yes, you kind of could. And so it looks like it's okay now, right? This is my maxim. This is my maxim. I can universalize my maxim. So it's fine for me to do this. And that's a kind of problem that, that again, was raised very quickly after Kant published. Is like, well, this is just a formal requirement. I'm just going to play with the rules to, you know, to, to tweak it. And Kant, I think, has a pretty convincing response to this, which is that's not your maxim. You're making it up, right? So your maxim is your actual principle of action. It's what's genuinely guiding your choice. It's what your intention is. And this is just another way of trying to make an exception for yourself. Like people shouldn't steal, but I can. You know, people shouldn't steal, but because I've got seven letters in my name, I can. This isn't a real reason. And you know it. You're just being dishonest. You have to test your real maxim. And that's kind of how he tries to, to deal with the tweaking of maxims just to get through the, the technical rules. But I think, I think there are genuine examples which it can't, it can't dismiss as, as easily, where you could say, and this one comes from, from David Wiggins, that it doesn't, it kind of flips it. it. It can't be universalized, but there's nothing wrong with it. So we, we have this mismatch in both cases between, does it pass the test? If it does, it's okay. If it doesn't, it's not okay. So we've tried the first one and, and maybe Kant has a bit of a response. You know, it doesn't actually pass the test if you use your real maxim. But here's the maxim that doesn't pass the test, but I can't see what's wrong with it. That it comes from David Wiggins and he says, um, there's a shopkeeper and the shopkeepers, and I'm willing, not like you're on a, well, maybe he was your honest shopkeeper, but he's fed up of being a shopkeeper. He doesn't like his job. Um, he's been a shopkeeper for 20 years and he's just getting a bit fed up and he wins the lottery. And he's like, right, OK, I've won the lottery. I don't have to continue in my job anymore. In fact, you know what? I'm never selling anything to anybody ever again. I've just had it with selling. I'm never selling anything. Now, obviously, he still wants to buy stuff. He's got all this lovely dosh in the bank now from, from the lottery. But if you universalize never to sell, 
but only to buy. You can't. It generates a contradiction in conception. If you want to buy something, somebody has to sell something to you. But that means you have to be willing to sell things. That just seems bizarre. Like a morally good person has to be willing to sell things. That's a very strange statement. So Wiggins says that kind of shows that there could be maxims, which are genuine maxims, which fail the test, but there's nothing wrong with them. Good. That was really helpful, Michael. And again, I think just like with the, with the first problem, it shows that there's something genius with Kant, but there are some real limitations here. And I suppose then brings on to the, the third main problem I want to think about, which is, again, it's something genius in Kant, a really important basis, but it's going to reveal some limitations. And that's about our motivations for doing things. So we, earlier on, we were talking about, Ben was talking about the shopkeeper and about acting in accordance with duty and, and acting from duty. And everything's got to be acting from duty. But of course, we know that we act from all sorts of motivations, love, fellow feeling, all sorts of things. And perhaps we haven't covered that enough. So perhaps we should just say what Kant actually says about those sort of motivations, love, fellow feeling, and so on, and then kind of then think about whether that shows any limitations for his theory. So does anyone want to, want to take that on? I think the um, the way that I've always approached this is kind of if you sort of, again, rewind to the start of the book a little bit and actually look at what he's trying to do. He's trying to find this first principle. And so when you think about the motivation for action, he says that it's got to be duty. Then we, of course, start to think about other ideas like, well, what about acting out of love? What about acting out of friendship? What about um, just being a genuine sort of egalitarian person? You just want to help people and all these sorts of things. Are these bad things to do? And he gives some examples himself of, of people like uh, what happens if there's a man who is, is so miserable that he wants to end his life but continues living because of a, a sense of duty. Wouldn't you say that the fact that he continues to live is, is a good moral thing to do because he does it because he ought? And we can see the moral value of that, whereas if he'd done it for other reasons – you know, that maybe it wouldn't be as moral or whatever it might be. The reason why he's trying to say this is because he's trying to get to the core of what is, if you like, necessary for something to be moral. He's not necessarily going to dismiss every other aspect of our life as being important to us, but he's trying to get in that first few pages, in that first chapter, just say, look, what is it that makes something distinctly moral? And he thinks it's this stuff, duty. It's this thing that we do called duty that really made this goodwill that's the most important thing. And so if you take that as his starting point, you can see why it is that he would then say things like, so if you're not doing things out of duty, then you could imagine cases where people did those things for other reasons and they weren't morally good. Um, it, the two things are separate. So, you know, there's you could do something out of love that wasn't necessarily morally good. You could do something that was, which was uh, supposedly egalitarian that wasn't morally good, and so on. And I think the idea here that people people get that sort of criticism uh, that Kant makes of other ways of viewing the world, but at the same time, it just seems to be so out of touch with certain aspects of our lives that that are real genuine motivations and we don't want to lose the moral character of those things. So mm -hmm. this is something which you could quite easily think about if you if you think about if you were in hospital is the usual example of this. You're in hospital and um, somebody comes to visit you. And I always say, imagine that you've got a relative that comes to visit you, you know, a, a brother or a sister, and you, you're you sitting there and you're kind of, oh, I've been really, really miserable. Thanks ever so much for coming. And they go, yeah, I know. I mean, you've got to, haven't you? I mean, that's the, that's the thing. And you say, well, you know, I mean, obviously you don't have to. You don't have to come and visit me if you don't want to. And they go, no, no, I do. Categorical imperative and all that. You've, you've got to, haven't you? Then you wouldn't actually see any value and worth in them being there. You're like, well, I prefer it that you weren't here if you just, you know, if that's the case. Because even then, if you say, oh, no, because you should be nice and friendly and all that. No, no, they're doing it out of duty. So it doesn't matter whether or not your presence actually makes them more miserable. You're doing your duty of being there. So that would be a good thing. Um, whereas imagine that somebody that you don't know very well, somebody from, you know, one of your colleagues that you work with, or uh, if you're a student, somebody in your class just turns up. And you don't speak to this person very much. And you say, 
what you're doing here. I don't know you very well. And they say, oh, I just heard about it. I heard about it. I thought it must be terrible that you're here in the hospital on your own. So I thought I'd just come and see you, cheer you up. That seems like a really genuine, lovely thing to do. And if the per- if you went, yeah, but you don't have to, their response might not be, no, but I do, categorical imperative and all that. They would say, no, but I wanted to. I just I just thought about it and I just thought you might need cheering up. It was a good thing. I know we don't talk very much, but now we can immediately see the moral worth and value in that, in that person's gesture, in that person's character and the way that they thought about things. But they were maybe completely oblivious to the categorical imperative or what their duty was. They just thought it was a lovely thing to do. And while Kant is happy to say that we can be motivated by other things, and that doesn't mean that they're not good. Being that lovely person is something that we should encourage. We should have nice, lovely, caring people that want to help others. His sort of way of shrugging off the moral value of it and saying, yeah, but it's not moral, is it? Works in some cases. We're happy to say in some cases, yeah, that wouldn't technically be what the shopkeeper isn't technically being moral there. But then when it's somebody who's just come out of the blue to come and see you in hospital, you kind of go, well, I don't know. I'm not as comfortable saying that there wasn't a moral worth to that, even if it's the not the exact kind of moral worth that Kant's on about. There's still something of value there. And I it may be introducing duty into that might spoil it a little bit. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, just to continue the stories, there's often that criticism, isn't there, which comes up with utilitarianism as well as as deontology, where people are in situations where they have to save people. It's not just visiting people in hospital, but are saving people. And and you know, it as typical in all of these examples that philosophers dream up, it's burning buildings or it's drowning or it's whatever it is, right? And, uh, you know, there you are, you're some person, you have to choose between the stranger and your spouse, or you have to choose the cancer scientist or the strange, whatever it is. And there's always some example like that. And you choose to save, uh, you know, in my case, I saved my wife. And, you know, why did you, why did you save your wife rather than a stranger? Why did you save your wife at all rather than just sitting there? Oh, I I mean, the obvious thing to say in those situations, I, I saved her because I love her or, Perhaps even I saved her because she's my wife. But if you said, oh, I, I saved it because it was going to maximise happiness, or if I, I, I say I saved it because it was my duty to do so, then people go, whoa, that's a bit weird. And the, the thought that often comes up is that's one thought too many. It's a type of justification or a style of justification that might be true according to the theory, but really doesn't capture what's going on in our moral lives. In fact, even saying I chose to save her because she's my wife may not be the right thing. Perhaps it's just I chose to save her because I love her, right? Whether she's my wife or or not. And so there's something, not just for Kant, but for other moral theories, where they're just not capturing quite what's going on intuitively, we think, in our in our moral lives, and the way you just brought out, Ben, about that hospital example, right? Someone just comes and said, I just wanted to come and see you and cheer you up. I, whether it's my duty or not, I don't really care. I just want to, but if you say, oh, yes, I, as you said, right, family member comes along, oh, I did it because it's my duty. It kind of, the, the visit falls a bit flat, right? We think something weird's going on there. Um, and perhaps that's something not just therefore a problem for Kant, though it is a problem for Kant and, and deontology, perhaps it's a problem for many, many moral theories, because the theories clashing with intuitively what we think should happen is not quite capturing it, because there's too much justification. There's in a way too much philosophy going on rather than, oh, now, now, I've, now I've started Michael on Michael. Too much just for, it's the wrong kind, as you said okay, earlier, the wrong kind good. of reason. And I think it's it's the, both of these theories, utilitarianism and and deontology or Kantian deontology, are seem to be focused on the impersonal. Yeah, we are emphasizing how yeah. every rational being needs to be able to accept this. But you know, I don't want you to have the same reason for saving my wife as I have. You know, if two of us are standing there, Simon, and you know my wife's drowning, and you jump in, and I say, "Why did you do it?" and you say, "Well, it's because I love her." That too is something which I now am worried about. Right? That's my reason, damn it. Um, if you're going to jump in, could you do it because it's your duty or, you know, for some yeah, other. Absolutely. <laughs> so I think this, this, this issue about partiality that kind of comes up as well, that, that we recognize partial relationships, relationships of a very special kind as part of our morality. 
And it's difficult, you know, that, that it's, it's a morally good thing to have relationships which are, which, which, which involve love and friendship. And that's not going to be directed towards everybody. And that's a good thing, too. And deontology often has moral duties which are related to partiality, but it, they do then struggle with this notion of exactly what the motivation is, because precisely in these relationships, your motivation is going to be different from the way that you treat strangers. And the notion of moral duty or the notion of maximizing happiness doesn't really deal well with these individual friendships and, and romantic relationships the way that you know, moral justification works at an impersonal level. And I think that's partly where the, where the problem lies. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Not, uh, not too much philosophy, just not philosophy of the right sort. There we go. I'm glad you caught me there, Michael. Um, listen, before we end things, should we just do a, a little bit on some of the work of Philippa Foote, which I know is is on uh, the AQA syllabus as a really classic paper. In fact, so Philippa Foote's one of my favourite philosophers of the of the 20th century, but it's something that I think some students struggle with. So just want to have a quick summary of what's going on in Philippa Foote and how it, how it connects with what we've been talking about. I can just, I can try. I said when we were talking about the difference between categorical and hypothetical imperatives that you know if there is such a thing as a categorical imperative, then they would be commands which you should do independent of your desires, kind of stemming from pure reason. And that's exactly what Philippa Foot wants to challenge: that there mm. are categorical imperatives in Kant's sense. There's some kind of set of binding commands on human beings which are independent of their desires. And she says, she, she starts by, by recognizing Kant's contrast between the presence and absence of that if clause. If you want to see the play, you should take your seats now versus do not lie, no if. And she says, yeah, okay, look, look, there are hypothetical imperatives and then there are non-hypothetical imperatives. Let's come up with a with a, with a clear contrasting term and, and set aside categorical for a moment. And she says, yeah, grammatically, that's certainly true. But we, we use the non-hypothetical in other circumstances as well, where the form of the, the, the command doesn't explicitly make use of the if. And she gives us an example, rules of etiquette or the rules of a club. Her own example is rather dated. Um, do not take ladies into the smoking room. I don't think many clubs are actually allowed to have rules like that anymore. <laughs> but suppose there was such a club, um, some kind of yeah throwback in time. Now, that doesn't actually say do not take ladies into the smoking room if you want to, you know, remain a member of the club, even if it's true that the punishment for doing so is that you get kicked out of the club. Similarly, the punishment for, you know, murdering somebody is that you get imprisoned. But we don't think that the right way of putting this is do not murder unless you want to go to prison, in which case it's fine. Go ahead. Um, so it's non-hypothetical because you know, do not take ladies into the smoking room just sort of stands alone. It's a rule. Um, and it doesn't have an if clause connects, um, connected to it. And similarly with, with rules of etiquette about, I don't know, how long you should shake somebody's hand for. You know, after you meet somebody first time, let go of their hand briefly after, you know, after shaking it briefly. That's not, you know, unless you want to be considered overly friendly or unless you, it's just, you know, it's how we should behave. So she points out that we have this kind of other form of imperative, the non-hypothetical imperative. But nobody thinks that club rules are kind of categorical in Kant's sense. For a start, you don't have to be a member of the club at all. And there's nothing wrong with that. So there's a way in which you can escape the imperative. But with Kant's categorical imperatives, it was supposed to be whatever you want, you know, whatever you're aiming at in life, this is something that you cannot do. But you don't have to be subject to the non-hypothetical imperatives in Foote's examples. So what's kind of going on here? And what she says is that the non-hypothetical examples is just kind of a, a feature of their context or their grammar or something like the way that we use it. It's not that they're completely independent of human interests per se. People like being members of clubs. And I don't know how to explain how why people like to be members of clubs where they couldn't take women to the smoking room. But I'm <laughs> Suppose there was, you know, that's a set of desires that people had about protecting women from cigarette smoke or something along those lines. Um, it still clearly referenced something about getting along well together. There was an aim, there was a purpose. So it's not categorical in the sense of being independent of what we want. 
So what she then suggests is, okay, so what's really going on in Kant's categorical imperatives is that they're non-hypothetical imperatives, but assumed relative to a very, very, very general human aim, which she would understand roughly in relation to flourishing, more an idea you'll explore with, with Aristotle and, and virtue ethics, this idea that, of notion of a, of a good life. But, you know, if you really don't buy in to the idea of having a flourishing life, having a good life yourself and being part of a society of people who are collectively pursuing a good life, you're not irrational to be immoral. You're just immoral. And what's wrong with you is that you're a bad person, not that you've failed to follow the commands of reason. You're just not signed up to flourishing. Now, thank goodness. Most people want to be good people. Most people want to flourish. They want to get on with other people and lead good lives. And that's, those are the implicit ends that moral imperatives actually reference. Uh, and so she argues there's no such thing as a Kantian categorical imperative. They're non-hypothetical, but they have an implicit aim built into them. If you want to be, live a flourishing life, if you want to get on with people, do not lie do not steal, do not murder, and so on. Thank you, Mark. That's really, really helpful. In fact, perhaps a, an extra comment from me, which uh, we haven't talked about yet, but I think is always there in the in the background for Kant and in the, in the groundwork, because so, so, certainly my students kind of come at this in the, in the wrong way, and that Kant's trying to give an argument to try to convince people to be moral, um, so as if he's having this discussion with, you know, amoralists or egoists or whatever, and, you know, if you read Kant in that way, you're kind of missing out on really what he's doing. And he's, he's talking to people who are already convinced, or whether they know it or not, that they want to be living this flourishing life, as you put it, from, from Philippa Foote. And he's trying to articulate and expand on and show us, you know, what in fact is involved in all our thinking, uh, rather than trying to convince an egoist or an amoralist, someone who isn't concerned at all about morality and trying to get them to be moral, because... If they read the groundwork, then this, all this stuff might not, might very well not convince them. Right? He's trying to really to appeal to people already on his team. I suppose that's the way to, to think of it. The thing that I always find interesting about looking at, at Foot at this stage and thinking about that idea of her, her sort of denial of the existence of categorical imperatives as Kant describes them is really handy when you start looking at things like anti-realism down the line and, and meta-ethics down the line. Because there's a way in which I sort of sort of run a thought experiment with the students to some extent that you start off with Kant saying, hey, guys, if we were going to have a moral system, what would those moral rules be like? Let's write a book on it. And you could read that in book in two ways. You could start off at the beginning and you could get to the end and go, cool, we know what the moral rules are now. Or you could get to the end of that book and go, cool, shame we don't have any of those. And that's kind of what, what Footy's doing. She's just getting to the end and going, yeah, I guess that's what moral rules would be like, wouldn't they? But we just don't have any. We have something which is kind of similar, but it's completely different to what you said. And then when you get down to people like Mackie and Hare and people like that, they're very much in the boat of, well, there are these things that we call moral rules and moral commands and moral imperatives and things like that. And I guess we talk about them as if they're like these universal things, but not. They don't actually have any universal grounding, but we talk about them as if they do. And a lot of students do make a connection there and go, is he a Kantian? Is that what he's saying? And you have to go, no, but he's sort of picking up on something that Kant did point out, that we're Kant is really keen on saying, don't you just realise that there's some stuff that we just think is universal? That's the key to morality. And people like Hare are kind of saying, no, it's the key to how we talk about morality. It's not the key to real actual categorical moral rules we just talk about them as if they're universal and that can be maybe a, a slip in some of what Kant's doing that it, and again like you were saying he's got to convince us then that this is the case and he does make some nudge towards reverence for the moral law which is kind of different to what Foote's saying you know Foote's trying to get us to follow the moral you know have moral values and things because of this idea of flourishing whereas with Kant it's like this once you see a moral law and you hold it, you know, kind of to borrow a bit of Descartes kind of clearly and distinctly, you feel this reverence for it. You understand the binding force of this rule. 
I get that to some extent. You know, when I realize in my head that I shouldn't do something, I kind of go, oh, bit awkward. I've just realized that I shouldn't do this. And now I don't feel quite so comfortable going along with it. But then if you don't care, just telling you need to bring something else into this because I can feel the reverence of the moral law and then just go ahead and not do it anyway. So you do need a much more Philippa footy sort of approach, I think. Great. Really helpful, Ben. A nice, nice advert as well for the episodes on, <laughs> on Metroethics sneak, snuck in at the end. Listen, we better leave it there, um, gents. Um, thanks very much, Michael, for coming on. Oh, thank you very much for having me. And Ben, thanks to you as well for coming on. No, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to you for listening. So that's the end of this episode on deontology, but there'll be lots of other episodes you can listen to on Philosophy Gets Schooled. 